In this video, I'm going to take you on a journey through the past. A history of Baldur's Gate 3 starting all the way back at its announcement trailer in 2019. For many fans, the lead up to BG3's launch was actually just as special and exciting of an experience as when the game fully released. Larian Studios is not your traditional studio, and this time period from June 2019 to August of 2023 was filled with excitement and fun moments, and most of this I would say was due to early access showing a very solid foundation for an innovative game, but also Larian's approach to marketing seemed to combine the feeling of them being this extremely professional, capable studio with access to AAA resources, while also being a company that comes across as down to earth or shall I say, relatable. Here's Bobby, who was the CEO of Activision Blizzard for 32 years. Well, I think there were great results. I think we had a good quarter. And if you look at all the metrics that we measure, uh, you know, we think that we've established a great pathway for growth. And here's Sven Vinka, Larian Studios owner, founder, and creative director in Baldur's Gate 3's first ever community update. <laughs> See the difference? But you know who else has the secret sauce? Factor, especially with this loaded bacon shredded chicken meal. Yes! Thank you to Factor for sponsoring this video. Getting sick of always prepping food when you're just trying to spend the little free time that you have gaming? Well, that's where Factor comes into play. Or perhaps you're like me and you don't even know how to cook or prep food in the first place. And that's when Factor really comes into play. Or maybe you're even more like me than I thought and you absolutely hate cleaning up. Well, Factor's got you covered, and the greatest thing about it is that these meals are fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved, and they're delivered right to your doorstep. All you need is two minutes, and then you're eating good. Take it from Grandma June. Is it good, Grandma? <laughs> My grandmother actually makes me come to her house to film these clips because she knows she's going to get a good meal, and she loves it, just like I do. Factor users get to choose from 35-plus weekly options, allowing you to meet your nutrition goals, and there's a ton of different categories, as you can see. There's also an assortment of breakfast options, smoothies, and juices, and a ton of nutritious snacks. So what are you waiting for? Head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code WOLFHEART50 for 50% off your first Factor box. And free wellness shots for life. Two free wellness shots from three available flavors for every order while you're an active subscriber. That's Factor75.com, code WOLFHEART50 for half off your first delicious box back to the video so larian launched the news of bg3 way back in june of 2019 with the premiere of their announcement trailer this trailer started with an aerial shot of the city of baldur's gate in seemingly good condition until the camera dropped down into the war-torn streets the first thing that fans spotted was a white symbol plastered on a wall in the city and this symbol we would later learn was a symbol for the cult of the absolute but at this time all that we could get out of it was that it seemed to contain the iconography of three evil quasi deities collectively known as the dead three bane ball and merkel we then witnessed a flaming fist guard morph into a mind flare in a matter of seconds which prompted many questions as the process of seramorphosis typically takes around a week Little did we know, this trailer was actually clever foreshadowing for the final chapter of Baldur's Gate 3. Many of us fans, although extremely excited, we were also a little worried that the mighty city of Baldur's Gate was going to be in an apocalyptic, ruined state, and that we would be denied that experience of walking the bustling market streets. Just one day later, we were then graced with the first ever Baldur's Gate 3 community update, and this was the birth of Sven and his armor set, of which I might add he did wear to the Game Awards in 2023. In this community update, we got to watch Sven attempt to convince Wizards of the Coast that his studio is worthy of obtaining the Baldur's Gate 3 license after he unsuccessfully had already attempted this in the past. Sven then got yelled at by the front desk manager at Wizards of the Coast for touching things that are not his. Sir, please yeah. don't touch that. Oh, sorry about that, sorry. To which he responded by stealing said item, the magical iron flask which can hold powerful creatures within. Yeah, sorry about that. He's got this thing in his head, so it happens from time to time. Sven was granted an audience, and Wizards of the Coast laid out what would need to be done if they were to give this license to Larian Studios. What, what is this going to take? This is going to be big. I mean, this is going to be a grand invention. Okay. It's got to be true to D&D &D lore and have you just been reinventing things, but we're not looking. Okay. Players have to feel that their choices matter. It's not 
uh, you know, it's not fake choices. It's, it's real, real decisions. Yeah, got it. Player agency. You know, and furthermore, I mean, you know, the creativity, the freedom, the graphics, I mean, just across the board, we're going to need to see just the best version that anyone's ever expected. We set the bar pretty high. Over delivery? Okay. Yeah. And we've got one more requirement. I think we need to really feature the process of cerebrophosis in this game. I think if we do that, <coughs> that will bring everything together and make it a true d, &D experience. Sorry, those is, eh? After the meeting was over, and in fear of getting denied once again, Sven took matters into his own hands by bashing uh, Mike from Wizards of the Coast on the head. What's the yeah. thing in the eye? Can you just point that out? <laughs> Trapping him into the stolen iron flask and then escaping back to Larian Studios where he would then work on the game regardless. Now that of course was all fun and jokes and Wizards of the Coast did grant Larian the license to work on this game. And I'm almost positive that it was Larian that came up with the grand ideas for Baldur's Gate 3 and then they pitched those ideas to Wizards of the Coast versus Wizards saying you need to do X, X, and X. Now the reason why this community update was so important goes further than just us getting new info on an upcoming game. This update gave us a glimpse into the passion that Larian Studios has, and clearly that passion stretches all the way up to perhaps the most passionate of them all, the owner of the studio. This was a very nerdy, some may even say cringy community update, and you know what? I wouldn't have it any other damn way. Trust me, I'm familiar with the cringe. Most importantly, Jimmy, I'm a dumbass. There's really no class out there for a man like that. I can be a fighter! And apparently Larian Studios was just getting started as that community update would be the start of a marketing campaign unlike any other. Let's now head to February of the following year, 2020. This was the PAX East Baldur's Gate 3 World Gameplay Reveal, where we got to see an early version of the character creator. Play as a human, you play as a Githyanki, you can play as a dwarf. We got to see a big chunk of the game's opening cinematic, which would leave us fans speculating for years to come. You, the player, is seemingly being held prisoner on a Mind Flayer ship, and one of those damn space octopuses puts a tadpole in your brain. And what the hell, are we going to be turning into Mind Flayers in this game? The Nautiloid ship then gets chased by a group of Githyanki Red Dragon riders, which makes sense because in the lore, the Githyanki race is on a mission to eradicate Mind Flayers from existence due to a rather rough past. As the Nautiloid ship flies over the city of Yartar, which is northwest of Baldur's Gate, it zaps up people, bringing up even more questions. And then it jumps to an entirely different plane of existence known as the Shadowfell, only to teleport away right as it appears to take massive damage. Alright, so an alien invasion by space octopuses that are being attacked by a bunch of ETs and we're on a space octopus ship apparently about to turn into a space octopus ourselves. Not a bad plot idea, but wait. Larian also released a statement telling us that the Mind Flayers are not actually the main antagonists of the game. We find ourselves on the center stage of a complot hatched by none other than the Dead Three, the gods of murder, tyranny, and death. Okay. Oh, okay. How, how in the Nine Hells do the Dead Three Gods connect to the Mind Flayers and the Gith Yankee? Nice job, Larian, because most of us had no idea, and the theories that would ultimately come close were never theories that people were fully convinced of, even the theory crafters themselves, such as the King, Harbs Narbs. Hi guys, Harbs Narbs here. Larian did a great job introducing some plot elements while also leaving it shrouded in an exciting mystery. Although I will say, as the game came closer to launch, Larian revealed a bit too much for my personal liking. With that said, it probably worked in their favor marketing-wise. But perhaps most importantly at PAX East, we got to watch Sven play a very early version of the game and witness him summoning Mage Hand to then slap an Intellect Devourer off a platform. My Mage Hand is bad at many things, but it's very good at throwing stuff. Uh, so I'm gonna just slap it. There you go. Uh. This was really fun and exciting to see, as us viewers were starting to see that player agency in this game was going to be a primary focus. No two players would likely ever handle an encounter in the same exact way. To make things even better, Sven then TPK'd. Let's hope that this one's gonna go right. <laughs> Oh, 
And then after reloading, he proceeded to attempt to climb on a few boxes that he stacked, but accidentally stabbed Shadowheart in the back. Do that. Oh, shit. This gameplay reveal also showed us players the amount of dialogue choices that we're going to have access to and how above and beyond Larian was going for cutscenes with the animations and the voice acting. It was fun, chaotic, unpredictable, and simply above and beyond, especially for a game in the CRPG genre, and this was only an early version of the game. Another really important aspect of the game that was revealed to us here was that we can enter into turn-based mode outside of combat, which would make activities such as navigating traps and stealing things a bit more tactical and easier as you get to go and then the world will take its turn after you go. This was a really cool, innovative mechanic. Although overall this presentation was very positively received, the most prominent criticism to come out of it was the game looking very much like Divinity Original Sin 2 with the user interface and just overall general aesthetics. For myself, I really had no problem with this as I love DOS 2, but it's also just very normal for companies to use assets from their previous games as placeholders and of course as foundational building blocks to build upon. This was also when the criticism of BG3 not being a Baldur's Gate game started to appear. Some fans of the originals seemed to be very angry at how Baldur's Gate 3 was looking as it gave off much more of a Divinity vibe versus a true Baldur's Gate game vibe, which was made by Bioware back in the 90s and early 2000s. I mean, the fact that Baldur's Gate 3 was revealed to be turn-based combat versus being real-time with pause like the originals didn't help the case. Although most, including myself, were happy with Larian innovating here and doing something different for Baldur's Gate 3, as this game was being created 20 plus years after the originals, and simply put, the times change. I could still, however, understand where a lot of the frustration was coming from. I mean, imagine if Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 were two of your favorite games of all time, and then another company comes in, takes the license, changes the combat system, and maybe you're a player who didn't really like the Divinity series from Larian because it is a different vibe, it's a different feel from other CRPGs, I personally wouldn't be too happy about that. This criticism, however, did not represent the entire original fan base, and most of the criticism would actually die out when Baldur's Gate 3 released, as basically everyone realized that Larian did something truly special here. Even if BG3 doesn't fit your vibe, it's clear that Larian went above and beyond, which I would say only elevated the Baldur's Gate name. The following month, in March of 2020, Larian did a Reddit AMA where they answered a ton of questions, with one of the most notable being that, all D&D 5e classes from the player's handbook were planned to be in the game. Whenever anyone asked for a release date for early access or the full game, the answer was always, when it's ready. Since this video does aim to highlight some of the big changes in Baldur's Gate 3 over the years, take a look at Larian's response to a question about reactions. The features and mechanics that allow a character to perform an action as a reaction will trigger automatically. The players will be able to control which reactions they want to enable in anticipation of enemy actions. Example, a wizard would disable their attack of opportunity but enable their shield spell, which will be cast automatically whenever the wizard is targeted by an attack or magic spell. As many of you are aware, when this reaction system was implemented into early access, it was not that great. It was far too binary and lacking in player control, there was no pop-up box, and using a reaction became more of a guess-ahead game as opposed to reacting in the moment. Many for quite a while wondered if Larian was going to be too stubborn to rework the reaction system. Well. They eventually did, despite their own initial feelings on it. Larian gave us a full reactions menu, and we could now enable reactions to pop up on our screen in the moment, allowing the player to actually react versus how it was before, where reactions would go off automatically or they don't go off at all depending on your settings. This was a testament to how well Larian uses early access and player feedback to help develop their games. It wasn't until June of 2020 where Larian gave us a fresh trailer showing some really cool shots such as this owlbear scene with Will. But this trailer most importantly came with an early access release window for PC. For fans who have been following this game up to this point, the hype was pretty insane, and this was perhaps even more exciting than the official launch of the game over three years later. Baldur's Gate 3 was launching into early access in August of that same year, but that actually got delayed to September 30th, which got pushed to October 6th. To spice things up, only two months later, in August of 2020, the initial release window for Early Access, Larian launched the start of their Panel from Hell series.
I don't know about you guys, but just hearing that music again gets me really pumped up. And these panels were designed to be these community updates slash marketing campaign shows that in my opinion, other studios could learn a thing or two from. This panel from Hell featured Sven and Adam Smith, Larian's senior writer, and had Jeff Keighley host it with special guest Chris Perkins from Wizards of the Coast. Although this first panel from Hell wasn't anything too crazy, it was really cool to see Sven dressed up in armor and both Sven and Adam sitting in some Baldur's Gate 3 movie looking set that clearly took a lot of effort to put together. A lot of us were thinking, this company's pretty cool. During this presentation, we got to see some really cool snippets of new gameplay that only greatly added to the hype. We watched a ranger cast Find Familiar. And then to our surprise, we learned that you, the player, can take control of that familiar. How cool. We watched Lazel rip a brain from a skull in a scene designed to show us not only dice rolls, but also player agency in terms of dialogue choices. And to expand on that even further, Larian had a voting system that let the Twitch crowd vote for the player character to make a goblin kiss their feet. But we also learned that you could kiss the goblin's foot in an attempt to slide off their toe ring with your mouth to steal it. Ugh. But damn, this game looks fun as hell. Then we got a demonstration of the Speak with the Dead spell. How cool to have that in a game, especially with it being represented with such fine animations and cutscenes. And that was followed by one of my favorite scenes, the approach into an owlbear's den. Larian certainly knew how to hype things up, and then the day finally arrived. October 6th of 2020, Baldur's Gate 3 launched into early access on Steam, GOG, and also Google Stadia. For a little quick Wolfheart lore, this was also the month that I walked away from my job to become a full-time YouTuber. I was all in. Huge thank you to all of you that supported me before Early Access even came out. You guys know who you are. Baldur's Gate 3 Early Access launch was a hit, and it broke Steam for a little while, so if you were like me, you also bought it on Stadia so you could play it immediately. It was reported that BG3 sold over 1 million copies in the first week on Steam alone, which is very, very, very impressive for an early access CRPG. Now, at the start of early access, players only had access to an unfinished, limited Act 1. There was no Mountain Pass area that didn't come until launch, nor was there the Grimforge area yet. We only had six classes to choose from with eight races, a very limited character creator. Max level was only level 4. And yeah, the overall game was far from perfect. Do you guys remember how janky some of those cutscenes used to be? But truthfully, all that really mattered at this time was that this game was fun as hell. This was the foundation of what many of us could tell was going to be a fantastic, innovative game. My footage of early access is a bit blurry as I'm using very old stream footage, but I'm sure many of you have already been noticing all of the differences. The UI differences are very noticeable, but Baldur's Gate 3's overall visuals were much more muted back then with less vibrance and less and lower quality lighting. This is what Shadowheart used to look like. And might I add, Shadowheart used to be sassy as hell. Larian toned her sassiness down a bit during a much later patch. Keep in mind at the launch of Early Access, us players didn't even have Karlak. We didn't know for certain that Karlak was even going to be a companion. She was just an NPC standing near the river with a much different appearance than what we have now. What we did have at this time was a sassy Shadowheart, Astarion putting a knife to our necks, Bazel treating us like chopped liver, Will was kinda nice but his story was a bit different back then and he was more of an insecure fraud than anything else. On release however, Will's story was heavily rewritten making him much more of an appealing character and Will also had a voice actor change. Of course you can, it just takes time. Umi, I don't need you to be like me. And well, Gal was probably the nicest out of them all if you could handle his humorous arrogance. At this time, we had no idea if Minthara was going to be a companion, and her character also went through a ton of hairstyle changes. And we had no idea what puny Helsin was going to turn out to be. Let me point out a few quick mechanical differences from the start of early access to the game's official launch. When EA launched, you could gain advantage on an opponent by simply walking behind them. You could do this basically every single turn. Ranged attacks made from high ground also gave advantage, which would later be nerfed to a plus two to attack rolls. Advantage in early, early access was given out like candy on Halloween, and this upset the balance between classes because certain classes that have the really good class features, spells, abilities, etc., that help the player's chance to hit 
those abilities and features and spells kind of became irrelevant. At the start of early access, camp supplies were not even a thing. You could just long rest with no cost at all. Reactions basically didn't exist. Party members' approval ratings would go off even if you didn't have that character in your party. If they're back at the camp and you say something away from the camp, they always would give their approval or disapproval. Cantrips used to always cause surface effects. So shoot a firebolt at an opponent and the ground also lights up. Super annoying, and many of us were getting DOS 2 flashbacks for sure. Magic Missile used to hit the environment all the time instead of your target. Shove used to not require a strength check, so every character was just shoving everyone every turn. It was insane. Stealth used to completely trivialize combat encounters. The map looked like a termite mound. Keychains did not exist, so you would have like 20 confusing keys in your inventory that you didn't know if you've used them or not. They're just, they were just everywhere. Having dark vision or a source of light was much more important in early access when you're in the darker areas of the game. Otherwise you would be attacking with disadvantage quite a lot. And the dancing lights cantrip actually launched in early access as only costing a bonus action. You used to have to jump each of your party members individually as they would not follow you if you jumped over something. Toggle group hide was not a thing. You couldn't select multiple items in your inventory. And the list really just goes on. Feel free to share some more in the comments below. The launch of early access was great, but most of us assumed that early access would last around a year, maybe a little bit more going off of Larian's previous game, but nope. Early access lasted from October 6th of 2020 all the way to August 3rd of 2023. Not only was Baldur's Gate 3 extremely ambitious, the world also went through a few global problems during these years. There was also the theory that Larian built their entire company below Water Table to discourage vampires from joining their firm. Larian's headquarters flooded far too many times, I, I will admit. Uh, during this time period, Larian also opened up a few new studios in different places around the world. This was certainly not a dead time, though, although there were periods in there where a lot of us players kind of stepped away to try to revitalize our interest in the game. But Larian continued dropping new patches with more and more content, and the Panel from Hell series also continued, and it not only served as just a general update on the game, but also as patch announcements for early access. Let me take you on a rather nostalgic journey. The Panel from Hell 2 took place on February 17th of 2021, and it served as the announcement for Patch 4 for early access. Us viewers started to learn that if there were not any technical difficulties, it wouldn't be a true Panel from Hell. Hello. Hi. You got a camera problem? There you are. Oh, All right. stop. You destroyed the camera. Well, it's first the mic, then the camera. It's the magic. What can I say? Right. Technology and magic doesn't work together. This was when the panels started getting a bit crazy as Larian went above and beyond in their set design and performances. Although, clearly they weren't professional actors. We even learned that Nick Pachinian, Larian's lead systems designer, was a cow but actually a druid who wild shaped into a cow. And this was the announcement for the druid class being added to early access. David Walgrave, Larian's executive producer was a tiefling. Silence is a really good uh, term uh, right now. So I'm just gonna get over there. We have more stuff to talk about. So as we just move over and thank you very much, David, for this very clear update. Uh, I know that you couldn't talk about what you wanted to talk about. And Larian had on special guest, Jeremy Crawford, a lead designer over at Wizards. The panel from Hell 3, A Most Noble Sacrifice, was July 9th of 2021. And holy crap, Larian did this crazy production where the camera shot was a first-person perspective of someone playing basically IRL D&D. How did you die? Lightning. Everywhere. And we, the viewers, got to vote to make the player do things. The production was crazy, but it wouldn't be a panel without tears in the weave. We'll give Larian a pass on this one, though, because they rented out a literal castle. This panel announced Patch 5 for Early Access, which introduced camp supplies, mini camps to better represent environments, inspiration points, Shadowheart's story got more mysterious, and much, much more. Oh yeah, and one more thing, salamis could now be used as melee weapons. 
The panel from Hell 4 was in October of that year, and it was more gameplay focused, and it announced Patch 6, which came with the Sorcerer class, and also an entirely new area for us players to explore, Grimforge. This was a huge patch, and many of us just couldn't believe that all this content was part of the game's first act. The panel from Hell 5 in February of 2022, Larian actually flew me out to Belgium, and I got to partake in it as a barbarian. <laughs> Although I kind of just look like a less handsome version of Jon Snow. And also, how the hell can I be a barbarian when Larian also had Belgium's strongest man come to the panel? It's, 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 it's gotten a lot. Ah, that must be Jimmy. Jimmy's back. Jimmy's back. Jimmy's back. All right. Oh. Jimmy, we're over here. Jimmy. Ah! Jimmy. Ah! We're here. Ah! Jimmy. We're here. Ah! Jimmy. Whoa. Jimmy. No, no. Ah! Oh, Jimmy. Ah! What? Jimmy. No! Jimmy. Ah. No! 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 Ah. Jimmy! What did I tell you not to get called up in your role? As you can see, Larian also hired some ice sculpture artists to sculpt a mind flayer for it to then be decapitated. No. No. Jimmy. Jimmy. No. This was really cool and so much fun because although I wasn't the biggest creator ever, I had been covering this game thoroughly since its announcement trailer in 2019. But aside from that, this was the announcement for Patch 7, which came with the Barbarian class and the ability to throw weapons and use improvised weapons. We got to watch some insane creative player agency as Nick wild shaped into a cat, reducing his weight, and then Sven proceeded to chuck the cat over a chasm. All right, you're all buffed up. This should be fun, Nick. How are you feeling? Um, lightheaded? <laughs> uh, well, here we go. All right. Whee. Oh. Ah, look at that. Uh oh. What happened? Oh, you, you threw me into battle. What? Are you in combat? I am in combat. Really? With who? Oops. Then Sven and I headed off to go rescue Nick. If you'd like to watch a video of my experience over in Belgium and at Larian's headquarters, I'll leave a link down below. The panel from Hell 6 in July of 2022, we got a rock concert from Larian's executive producer, David. <laughs> And this panel was also the announcement for Patch 8, which was one of the most fun patches as it brought us players the Bard class, and maybe even more importantly, the performance ability. We also got new hair shading models, Swarm AI, which was really needed as the AI just took forever before this feature came to the game, and much, much more. Just before the next panel, Larian dropped a Twitter post trailer that, in my opinion, was one of the most hype trailers that they've done, and also one of the most well-done trailers that I've seen, as it was a bit of a lore video. And it showed Minsk being unpetrified. At this point in time, we didn't know what companions from the original games would be seen or make it into Baldur's Gate 3. The panel from Hell 7, The Holy Night, took place in December of 2022. And Jeff Keighley came back and also Santa Claus made an appearance. Huh? What's that? What's this? I hear something. I hear something. Is that coming thing from the roof? Oh, oh who's yeah, that? Is it... Oh, 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 we have a visitor! Oh, oh Santa! Oh, Santa! Santa! <laughs> This panel was the announcement for Patch 9, which included the popular Paladin class and also a level cap increase to 5, which was huge as level 5 is when players get extra attack and level 3 spells. We also got the reaction system overhaul that we had all been longing for. The craziest thing about this panel, though, was the trailer that it came with. But actually, this trailer was dropped, I think, a week before the panel. And in this trailer, we got to see Jahira and Minsk. Jahira was actually the narrator for the trailer. Both of these characters are two of the most iconic companions from the original games. This trailer also finally gave us a release date idea as Larian announced the release month was going to be August of 2023. Also during the panel, to everyone's surprise, Matt Mercer from Critical Role made an appearance showing us all that he was going to be the VA for Minsk. You point, I punch. Villainous face. Meet virtuous fist! 
In February of 2023, Larian dropped their release date announcement trailer, which revealed the mighty Ketherick Thorm, whose VA was the legendary actor J.K. Simmons. Baldur's Gate 3's release date was going to be August 31st, 2023 for PC. A few months later in June, we got the reveal of Jason Isaacs, va for Gortash, another one of BG3's antagonists. This trailer also showed us a bit of the city of Baldur's Gate, which was major hype. But just a few days later, Larian actually gave us a full trailer called Returning to the City After 20 Years. It was looking phenomenal. And it wasn't until the following month, July, on the 7th of 2023, where Larian put on the final Panel from Hell show. This was the release showcase, and Larian invited quite a few gaming press peeps and also content creators, including myself, to go watch it live. All of us that were invited, we also got to play the release version of the game for a few hours, and Sven gave us a private presentation of the game, which had some really cool stuff in it. I didn't even tell you guys because I didn't want to spoil anything. This panel from Hell showcased the Dragonborn race and half-orcs, and we got to see the monk class in action. But perhaps most importantly, this was the reveal of the Dark Urge customizable origin character. We also watched Helsin turn into a bear, and yeah, you, you probably know the rest. <laughs> this was one of the greatest marketing tactics of all time, in my opinion, as Larian Studios was the talk of the industry for weeks to come. It didn't cost him a thing. Craziest thing about this panel, though, was the reaffirmation that Larian was moving up Baldur's Gate 3's launch day to August 3rd for PC from what was previously announced as August 31st. Although I don't know for sure, if I had to guess, this was a response to Bethesda announcing Starfield's release date just a week after BG3's initial planned release date. Larian then dropped the Orin trailer, which only increased the hype as it was just nuts to see such a psychotic antagonist. And then the game finally released for PC on August 3rd, September 6th for PS5, and December 7th for Xbox. Baldur's Gate 3 would then go on to win more awards than I can count, including Game of the Year at the Golden Joysticks Awards, the Game Awards, the Dice Awards, and more. The voice actors became absolute stars in the industry. Many of them started streaming Baldur's Gate 3, and some of them had never really played video games in the past, and almost everyone seemed to be rooting Larian on. It was a phenomenal success, especially for a game that many would categorize in the CRPG category, which can be a rather niche gaming genre. BG3 even reached number 9 on the Steam charts for most concurrent players as it reached a peak of 875,000. Don't forget, that's just Steam players. Larian Studios is the current definition of a large consumer-friendly company. In my opinion, they deserve every bit of success that came and continues to come their way. The Panel from Hells were such a great idea to show us fans how much they care about their game and making it the best that it can possibly be. Larian also showed us what can happen when a company stays free of greedy outside influence, and hopefully they inspire some other studios to stay independent or strive to become more independent in the future. Thank you all so, so much for watching. This video took quite a while to put together, which is why I really appreciate having sponsors on the channel, such as Factor, and also, of course, all you channel members and patrons, and this allows me to spend more time crafting a single really high quality video versus putting out just a ton of content of lower quality. If you're interested in supporting the channel, there will be links below and I'll catch you all on the next one.